My guest today is Professor James Shapiro, who is Professor of Microbiology at the University of Chicago. An expert in bacterial genetics, he proposes a concept of natural genetic engineering, a process described to account for novelty created in the process of biological evolution. He's an advocate of non-Darwinian evolution and is a critic of the modern synthesis. Welcome, Jim. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So I always wondered about this, Jim. Um, I know nothing about it, uh, but it, it, it seemed a little bit um, difficult to understand. So, so I want to start with one of your papers. Evolutionary change is naturally biological and teleological, you say. So you say yeah, Darwin is eating. You still. Say it again, Jim. Uh, there was there was a uh, you froze while you were asking the question. Uh, not yet. So I was just going to um, read a little bit of the abstract. Okay. So so you say here Darwin in 1859 and his followers in the first half of the 20th century attempt to remove any innate biological action in hereditary variation so that natural selection could be the only determinant of the direction of evolutionary change. You say in so doing, they oblige themselves to assume that gradual selected accumulation of small character changes due to random mutations could produce macroevolutionary differences in morphology, metabolism, and behavior over long periods of time. So this has been the conventional wisdom, right, Jim? And we don't really have any evidence for this to be true. Is that is that the is that the way to think about it? Uh, yes, because um, we know we now read the the uh, the evolutionary history directly in the DNA sequences, and and we know that change happens in in different ways, and we also know experimentally that change happens in different ways too. Darwin was, for, for, for theoretical reasons, had to, to uh, think of sort of random gradual evolution, evolutionary change, what's called phyletic gradualism, that also fit with his, what he learned from his uh, ge geology professor um, in Edinburgh, uh, who was a uniformitarian, and everything happens just like it does now, that there aren't changes in, in the processes. That's very different from a, a, a sort of punctuated equilibrium kind of view, where you, you have episodes of dramatic change, and then you have periods where there's little or no change. In evolutionary theory, this, this is uh, now uh, uh, treated as the difference between microevolution, which is gradual change that occurs within species, and macroevolution, which is the evolutionary process that generates new species in new taxa. And uh, macroevolution is, is a much different kind of evolutionary change. Hmm. And we can observe it in real time. Yeah, so I always wondered about Jim, about this, Jim. I, I don't know much about this, but uh, I do some work in artificial intelligence you know, when we uh, when we design systems. You're freezing we, on me again. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Jim? I, I get a note saying bad network quality. It may oh, be okay. my network. It, 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 it yeah, should be okay, like, but, but can you hear me okay, though? Yeah, wait a minute. My... my You there, Jim? Jim, can you hear me? I'm back. Can you hear me? Uh, I can. I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, it looks like the network is working much better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
So I, I was going to ask you, Jim, you know, so I do some work in artificial intelligence and when we design systems, we don't design them to look for random data. Um, so, you know, there's a concept called reinforcement learning in, in computer science. And it's all about actually designing for emerging data. So that, that's what we do mm -hmm. in, in computer science. I would expect nature to do something, <laughs> something along those lines, than rather than sitting back and looking for random mutations, right? Well, absolutely. Uh, and we know that that's the case. If we look at any uh, uh, evolutionary process, uh, we see that there are uh, adaptations and, and routines which makes those adaptations work more efficiently. The, the, the first uh, uh, evolutionary question I, I was became familiar with was the evolution of antibiotic resistance in bacteria. Yeah. And this was happening very actively in the 1960s when I was doing my PhD. And it, the, the conventional theory was that it was random mutations which altered the cell. But it turned out that bacteria had all of these tools called resistance factors, plasmids and, and other factors, which allowed them to accumulate antibiotic resistances and mechanisms which made them resistant to antibiotics and transfer them from cell to cell. And that was a much more efficient way of doing it. So there was the step of, of having these systems which should allow them to put DNA together in certain ways. And then when the challenge of antibiotics came up, it was applied to the resistance mechanisms for antibiotics. It's used for other systems as well. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's an amazing thing to think about. So, so what you argue, if I understand this correctly, Jim, what you're arguing is that uh, organisms are, are sort of actively seeking DNA, uh, and I think you call it sort of um, hybridization. Of, of organisms, and, and that's really driven by the need for change. And well, so it, it's not like the organism is sitting back and looking for a random mutation to happen and then go on from there, but rather, given, given the, the parameters, given stress, given all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of different things it has to do to survive, it is actually seeking to change. Is that the way to think about it? Uh, that's that's a good way to think about it. Uh, what I'd like to say is that if they can't, an organism can't change, it can't survive, and and life would go away. Uh, uh, remind me to come back to the hybrid question because it's actually a very specific reference that I'm making there. Yeah, and I need to, I need to explain that. Um, but the organisms have these tools to adapt, and they can regulate the, the functioning of these tools. So for example, um, bacteria can accumulate antibiotic resistances in structures called integrons. And I don't have to get into the details of that, but it uses an enzyme called an integrase. And normally that enzyme is not functional. Yeah. But when, when DNA transfers from cell to cell, it comes in as single-stranded DNA, and that activates expression of the integrase. So the integrase works when it's, the, when it's a suitable situation has arisen for it to function. Mm. And there are those kinds of, of uh, sophistications, if you will, in the process of, of what I call natural genetic engineering that make it more functional. Yeah, so so t talk a bit about the hybridization concept, Jim. So yeah, no, this, um, is, this is yeah. Go ahead. There's there's a, a, a wonderful article in the, in the Scientific American in 1951, I believe it is, hmm. by a man who studied hybridization, called cataclysmic evolution, by Ledyard Stebbins a pioneer and a, and a very important uh, uh, founder of the modern synthesis. He studied hybridization in plants. 
And what happens when you make a hybrid between two closely related species, which normally they don't, they normally don't mate, but they can mate at some low efficiency. Yeah. And uh, when you get a hybrid offspring, all of a sudden the genome becomes very unstable. And you get dramatic changes in, in the chromosomes. You activate the movement of what are called mobile genetic elements. And you get major changes spread throughout the genome because when you hybridize two organisms, the whole genome of each one is involved. So it's not individual traits, it's the genome as a whole that changes. And we know that's, that's how we, we create species. We don't create species by selection. We create species by hybridization. And now in the DNA record, we can see that the hybridization has been going on all the time among animals, among plants. And it may be one of the major, if not the major, forces stimulating evolutionary change. Hmm. Yeah, I, I remember, Jim, reading uh, in, in one of your papers or, or one of your talks that um, we had sort of um, the, the, the original uh, bacteria and uh, ar arcanes is what it's called. So there were two Archaea, types of yeah. Yeah, two uh, different yeah, types of cells early on, right? And then that combination might have led to a third variety. Is that, well, is that... yeah, well, this, this is a very interesting story. We, we didn't know about Archaea until 1977. They were discovered by Carl Woese and his colleagues at the University of Illinois. And they were very early uh, applicants of, of, of what's now called phylogenomics, using DNA sequence to infer evolutionary relationships. And it turned out they had these things which were thought to be bacteria, organisms that, that come from various places, uh, but they, they weren't bacteria. They had different uh, uh, RNA sequences in their ribosomes. And they, we later realized that those are what we now call archaea, and they're just as abundant as bacteria. They're different in many ways, and they don't cause diseases, which is very interesting. I don't know why that is, but they aren't pathogens. And um, it's interesting to, rem to realize that it was only in 1977, less than 50 years ago, that we discovered almost half of all living organisms on Earth. And so for, for at least uh, three and a half billion years or more, we've had bacteria and we've had archaea. We know that from the fossil evidence. Yeah. And it was about a little less than two billion years ago, the, uh, the eukaryotic cell was formed. That, mm -hmm. That's the kind of cells that we have. And uh, the mitochondrion was a key component of the eukaryotic cell. Mm -hmm. And by looking at its uh, uh, ribosomes in the same way that Woese discovered uh, archaea, we can see that they are descended from bacteria. And the, the rest of the cell, the, the outer part of the cell, or certain systems, are descended from archaea. So there was a fusion about two, two billion years ago that created the first eukaryotic cells. And uh, they've had tremendous ability to evolve uh, much more complicated organisms like ourselves. Yeah, so so this is a sort of a foundational thing uh, for your for your uh, concept for your theory, right? So, yeah, if uh, bacteria and arche archaea sort of join together to form um, form ourselves, <laughs> so to speak, uh, and, and it's a very complex form. But when we look into ourselves, we find as you say, mitochondria, we find all sorts of complications there. Yes. Uh, but it is, it, is, it is sort of derived from simpler systems merging, right? Is that, is that what we think? Yes, and uh, the, the great proponent of this, what's called symbiogenesis, was Lynn Margulis, who's actually a Chicagoan too. 
she went to, to uh, the lab school with my brother, and she passed away in 2012. Um, then argued for a long time that cell mergers created new types of organisms, and uh, she was not taken seriously. But then when all of a sudden we could do the, the, the DNA sequencing and the RNA sequencing, we found that indeed the eukaryotic cell was a merger of bacteria and archaea. And uh, from that, uh, all kinds of different organisms evolved. And plants uh, and uh, algae evolved from uh, fusing with another kind of bacteria, with cyanobacteria, which had evolved oxygen uh, producing photosynthesis. So uh, sy symbiosis and symbiogenesis has been extraordinarily important in the history of life on Earth. Yeah, I, I know that we're talking about long time scales, Jim, but I was just thinking, uh, I know nothing about this. I'm just thinking, is there a sort of an experiment we could design where you know, organisms have the luxury of combining and organisms don't have the luxury of combining. And could we, could, is there any way in, in our sort of time scales we could see there's a difference? Uh, well, I've been arguing for such experiments for a number of years now. The, the, the tradition is to use pure cultures, single organisms. Because the idea was that all the evolutionary change takes place within the genome of each organism. But in fact, interactions between organisms and also between organisms and viruses are very important in, in evolutionary history. So we could do experiments where we try to evolve something to carry out a process, say, say grow on a certain material, uh, where we have mixtures of, of, of different cells and see if that works, and then analyze what arises from that and determine how that happened. And as a control, we do the, the pure cultures. And uh, the prediction would be that there are some things for which pure cultures would not give you any, any results because a single organism can't evolve all the capabilities it needs. But okay. mixtures of organisms can give you something new. Yeah, so that, that will sort of conclusively prove this idea, right? So if it is totally random mutations that makes evolution happen, we shouldn't see any difference because randomness is there in both systems. But if combinations are really driving evolution, then we will see a difference. Yeah, yeah. And, and the hybridization story is a little bit of that. Because there is combinations of two different species, and 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 they you get novelty from that. Um, yeah, you get novelty from. So you you, you mentioned uh, McClintock's work here. Um, I, I I believe she she was a Nobel laureate, wasn't she? Yes, yes. So she, you she got a Nobel. Nobel. Yeah. So go ahead, Jim. Sorry. I was just going to say that, that that Barbara got the Nobel Prize when she was eighty three years old. 81 years old. She got it in 1983. And uh, people didn't believe her when she first t told them what she had discovered, which is that when you put uh, maize plants under severe stress, they actually activate what she called controlling elements. These were pieces of the genome which could move from one place to another. Mm. And uh, people didn't believe her. And in fact, they were angry at her because this didn't fit with the gen genetic uh, uh, dogmas of the day. But in the 1960s and 70s, we discovered that these kinds of mobile elements uh, were present in all organisms. And they actually play a very important role in evolutionary change. Yeah, so it's mobile elements, as you say. So this is, you call it mobile DNA. Yeah. And and so um, for the general public, so so how, how does it work, Jim? I mean, what, what do you mean by mobile DNA? Well, mobile DNA is DNA that can move from one place in the genome to another, and or mobile genetic elements. Um, 
some DNA can transfer from one cell to another, but, and that's mobile too. But what McClintock discovered was that there were these elements which can spread, go to different locations in the genome. And also they could accumulate in genomes. In fact, our DNA is anywhere between 40 and, and 65% mobile DNA. Our protein coding DNA, uh, genome is one and a half percent. So this mobile DNA is certainly most of our DNA, and it actually turns out to be important in a number of interesting ways. But one of the things that's important about mobile DNA is it can create networks in the genome so that you can encode complex traits, complex processes, which you cannot encode by just having individual isolated parts of the genome as func functioning. The ability to move DNA to new locations and move the same piece of DNA to, to different locations mm. means that you can create systems that express complicated uh, functions, much like you, you would move cassettes when you're doing computer programming. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it gives, gives a lot of flexibility from a design perspective. So you say the movement of the various types of transposable elements to new genome locations triggered by ecological challenge and organismal stress. You say this mobile DNA cassettes, as you say, serve as dedicated change operators where evolutionary transformation is most necessary. It's almost like there is a machine sitting there with a lot of flexibility. <laughs> you know, without knowing anything about it, Jim, I'm just uh, making it mechanistic. It's a machine sitting there with a lot of flexibility and given a set of conditions, given set of requirements and objective function, the machine can organize itself to solve that in some ways. Yeah, um, one of the big differences between the kind of evolution I'm, I'm, I'm arguing for and the, the uh, conventional view is in the conventional view, the organism is totally passive. It doesn't do anything. In the, the evolution that uses transposable elements, it has cells merging and so forth. That's active evolution, and the organism is activated when it gets in trouble. And it's activated to change, which is a, a very important survival uh, uh, mechanism. So the organism, in some ways, is causing evolution. So given a set of um, boundary conditions, given a set of conditions in general, the organism will, will essentially design itself to, to counteract that. And, and that is what we see in the history of evolution. Is that, is that the way to think about it? Yes, exactly. I mean, this idea that, that these mobile elements could format networks in the genome um, was sort of uh, when, when uh, some other scientists discovered uh, a lot of repetitive DNA in the genomes. They, they said that this would be a way of distributing control sites to different places where they would do certain tasks. And as people have done more genomic analysis, they've discovered that all kinds of things, um, all kinds of uh, important evolutionary advances are due to these mobile elements moving to new locations. For example, the, the body plan of the vertebrates, four-limbed, body plan is, was initiated by these mobile elements in the genome. Um, uh, viviparous re reproduction, um, the placenta and the uterus are, are formatted by these mobile DNA elements, mm -hmm. different ones in, in those cases, uh, to, to develop They're very complicated structures. And it takes a lot of different functions to make them work, but they're tied together by these shared mobile elements. Yeah, so, so I was thinking, Jim, you know, um, if there's some sort of a, uh, again, sort of an experimental uh, empirical view of this, so suppose I have island X and island Y, and island X has huge amount of stress, environmental conditions changing, all sorts of things happening, and island-wise very stable. And 
quiet, <laughs> let's say, we would expect Island X to have a higher level of evolutionary change, right? If this the theory is true. Yes. Do, do we have any practical, you know, sort of, uh, do we have any, um, have, you know, can, can we look at any data in that context? Yeah, I mean, you, you, there are certain uh, capabilities you, you can select for. You can ask organisms to gain new capabilities, and many of them do it by moving this, these, this mobile DNA to new locations. And that often activates or inactivates expression of certain functions. Um, I don't know how uh, complex we've uh, uh, how much complex evolution we've succeeded in observing directly, um, because many of the experiments have been limited to to bacteria and, and yeast. Yeah. Uh, but we see that that these elements move and change the expression of of sequences or create new sequences, and um, that gives you a, a, a new type of organism with new capabilities. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see this, Jim. I mean, we, you know, going back to computer science for a, for a second, there is no way we're going to design systems that is just going to sit back and look for random, <laughs> random changes to happen. Uh, when there's emerging data, you can you can take advantage of emerging data to and to get better. Uh, from an from an artificial intelligence perspective, yes. and so it, it seems very unlikely that we will have nature designing systems that rely on random random changes to get better. Well, one of the things that has never been addressed in the traditional view is that most random changes are deleterious. Yeah. So what happens to the deleterious changes while you're waiting for the favorable ones? Right. That's that's always a big challenge for the the theory of of of, of uh, positive evolutionary change by random mutation. Yeah, I wonder if the conventionalists will say the deleterious changes basically takes that organism out of out of contention. We would never see it in the future. Um, yeah, they have these population um, uh, uh, genetic models for, for evolutionary change, but we know that it's, it's, it's rapid events, it's, it's interspecific hybridization, for example, that generates species. I don't know yeah. of any, anybody okay. who's generated a species by random mutations. Yeah, so you're under the paper here, uh, Jim. So engines of innovation, biological origins of genome e evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked a bit about this. So genome change does not occur accidentally. The conventional modern synthesis view of gradual evolution guided solely by natural selection fails to incorporate many important lessons from direct examination of genome structure by modern genomic sequences. So so, so what exactly are you talking about there, Jim? Well, when we when we look at genomes, they're not the way that they were supposed to be, as predicted by the modern synthesis. They yeah. they have all of this uh, uh, um, they have a, a degree of structure and organization that I'm sure is far more complex than even the most high tech. Um, electronic systems. Yeah, I mean, we're continually discovering new ways that organisms refine and, and regulate and and do things in their in their genomes. And when it was discovered that uh, much of the DNA in the genome was repetitive, it was called junk DNA because the idea was that genes were unique and didn't repeat themselves and it didn't do anything. Um, but then people discover that that, that so-called junk DNA actually forms part, encodes different molecules, RNA molecules, which do all kinds of different jobs during the life of an organism or the life of the cell. And uh, we now realize that the whole genome is, is uh, a very 
complex, um, how shall I put it, database, if you will, um, which which carries out very complicated maneuvers to to make cell reproduction and and multicellular development possible. Hmm. Yeah, it didn't feel right, Jim, when you know this idea of you have this DNA and there is a good part of that is never used for anything. <laughs> it, it just seems uh, unlikely, uh, at least you know for a layman's perspective. Why would you have something that's not being used um, for anything. There's a, yeah, there's a very interesting paper published in 2013 by John Maddock and one of his colleagues from Australia, where they, they compared the complexity of the organism defined by the number of cell types it has against the quantity of protein coding DNA and the quantity of non coding DNA, most of which is this repetitive DNA. And it turns out that the protein coding DNA peaks at about uh, three times 10 to the seventh base pairs per genome, whereas the non coding DNA just continues going straight up to over three times 10 to the 10th nucleotides per genome. Yeah. So what was said to be non coding actually turns out to be to trace organismal complexity better than the coding DNA. Yeah, I mean, my sense is that nature is quite efficient. Um, so when we see a mechanism and we say we don't understand 80% of it, it's more likely that we don't understand it <laughs> rather than it's not doing anything. Right, well, we should, ne we should never uh, think we know everything. That's one of the problems with uh, uh, people who advocate the, the, the modern synthesis, the conventional view of evolution. They think they have all the answers. But we keep discovering things that weren't <laughs> predicted, like transposable elements, and then uh, non-encoding DNA, and um, functional RNA molecules, non-coding RNA, which does do different jobs in the cell. Um, we're always learning new things that we didn't anticipate. Yeah, so, so I want to return to, you talk about this in the, this paper too, about this interspecific hybridization has yeah. played in the rapid generation of new species. So you say interspecific hybrids display altered epigenetic regulation and yes. genome expression. Great genome variability, including activation of transposable elements, we talked a bit about that, and chromosome rearrangements. And you said frequently whole genome duplication as well. So. The, the the real mechanism here for evolution, at least if I understand this correctly, Jim, is really hybridization, not not mutation. Yeah, hybridization is the trigger. And if you think about it, uh, the hybridization does can do two things. One, it can it can activate the transposable or mobile genetic elements. So they can move to new locations. You can create new networks, if you will, with those elements moving to different places. At the same time, it doubles the, the content of uh, protein coding, and actually now we know RNA coding sequences. So you have two copies, double the number of copies that you had before. So you have one set that can function and do the functions that pre-existed. And another set of which you can modify as you, in a, any way you want, or put together in different combinations, and get new circuitry out of it. And that has happened in evolution. Yeah. Does it have any applications, Jim? I'm you know, thinking COVID-19, seasonal flu. My limited understanding is that much of these things happen by inter, by intra, or interspecies jumps of viruses, right? So are there other any applications there? Well, in, in uh, uh, crop design, uh, hybridization is, is, is the most powerful tool that we have. We've been using it for thousands of years. Wheat, for example, arose about 8,000 years ago as a, uh, first as a hybrid between two plants and then as a hybrid with three plants. Uh, and that's how, how emmer wheat and then flower wheat came into being. That's what Stebbins was referring to as cataclysmic evolution. 
and that was the beginning of agriculture. Um, nowadays, we want to breed plants that can survive under climate change conditions. And we're going to do it much better by hybridizing the plants and seeing what comes out of it, and letting the plants generate the novelty than we are by trying to figure out, well, what, what, what particular proteins or what particular functions should we change to adapt to this new environment? Yeah, so I want to go to another paper you have. So what prevents mainstream evolutionists teaching the whole truth <laughs> <laughs> about how genomes evolve, you ask? Um, and we talked about this already, the common belief that the neo-Darwinian modern synthesis, MS, was buttressed by the discoveries of molecular biology, you say is incorrect. On the contrary, those discoveries have undermined the MS. The, so you discuss here many processes revealed by molecular studies and genome sequencing that contribute to evolution, but nonetheless lie beyond the strict confines of the modern synthesis formed in the 1940s. I guess, Jim, you know, one problem with science is that uh, the confirmation and conformation biases are quite high. Uh, but when something is established, it's quite difficult to get uh, get around it, isn't it? Yeah, well, um, that, that's people who think that they understand everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and they think they've got the answer. And so they, they have a, a point of view and they interpret everything new that comes along to fit their point of view. I, I was mentioning to you uh, that I, I was just dealing with something earlier today uh, that fits our discussion. And uh, it was a, uh, I was asked to write a commentary on a paper which talks about the messiness of molecular biology and how it's non-Darwinian and it doesn't fit with Darwinian principles. But the authors look at it from all of the perspectives of, 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 uh, of Darwinian ideas. And they can't grasp the ideas of complexity, of circuitry, of novelty, of complexity, of uh, stepwise uh, um, building upon uh, uh, past complexity, um, uh, robustness, and so forth. These are ideas which are very much uh, 20th and 21st century ideas, um, but they're 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 foreign to the. Uh, the, the modern synthesis people. Yeah, it's um, it's always difficult to um, go against the <laughs> against the institutional grain, so to speak. Um, so, so I, I want to go. So, you have a second edition of your uh, your book coming out. Yes, it's coming um, out a week from tomorrow. It's coming out tomorrow. So, um, so this a came out in tomorrow. 2011. Uh, mm -hmm. The first version, so evolution, uh, a view from the 21st century, and then you have a second edition coming out, evolution, a view from the 21st century, 45. Um, we we have a lot more data now, I would imagine. So, so I, I I'm thinking that the book is I haven't read the book, Jim, but I, I'm thinking the book is talking about all these concepts that we just talked about. Yes, uh, what what I did was I. Uh, I had to republish the first edition because it disappeared from the uh, from Amazon. <laughs> Even the Kindle version, which is electronic, disappeared. Wow. It wasn't it went out of print; it went out of existence. <laughs> and and um, and then I added some some an introduction and and, and four articles that I've written since the, the book was published in 2011 which show how we've acquired a great deal more information, which is, that's why it's called fortified, because it, 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 it bolsters the position that I'm taking. Yeah. We know a lot more about how these things happen and how, how things like mobile elements are, are very important evolutionary tools. Yeah, I love this, Jim. I, I, I have a bias here. I never felt random mutations really explained 
<laughs> what was going on. Uh, we thought, you know, I, I, I know nothing about it, but it just from a purely from an engineering perspective, it, 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 uh, it felt weak <laughs> from, from my viewpoint. Yeah. Um, but what you're, what you're um, describing here is not randomness, but really the organisms themselves counteracting the, the environmental stress that they have to deal with. And they could right. do it in a lot of different ways, right? They could do it a lot of different ways. Um, I was misquoted by uh, uh, one person, uh, an intelligent design advocate, is saying that cells had algorithms for evolution. <laughs> you can't have algorithms because you don't know what the, how, how the ecology is going to change, what, what kind of changes are going to be necessary. But they can d generate a lot of different changes, and they're not all going to be successful. But the ones that are successful will be, be fixed, and uh, there will then be a whole new array of, of uh, functional information encoded in the genomes and embodied in the organisms and it'll be ready for the next uh, challenge yeah i see the slippery slope there jim so um, uh, the idea that random mutations not do not necessarily drive evolution uh, doesn't mean that we're talking about intelligent design by any stretch of the imagination, uh, it, it's a it's it's slightly different concept, isn't it? I mean, if I understand this correctly, Jim, what you're saying is that the environmental factors, environmental stress, and other attributes drive the organism to seek a better position, either by either by acquiring other DNA mm -hmm. or by combining with available other sources and variety of other actions the organism could take, it's an active, active evolution rather than a random passive evolution. Uh, yes, it's idea. Yeah, it's active. Now, to, to what degree there's any kind of uh, specificity or bias involved? To what degree it can integrate any of the information that comes from the nature of its stresses, for example. Uh, we don't know that because we haven't been able to explore that. That's been a forbidden question. Yeah. But now that we know that these elements uh, are important evolutionary tools, and, and we know that they act in, in very non-random ways, they have all kinds of different specificities. Why they do, we don't know. But uh, we can begin to explore what the... What the uh, the, the, the potential benefit of those specificities might be. And we can ask uh, uh, larger questions about how the systems work. Uh, it may be that they are pretty good AI machines, but it's not AI, it's natural AI. Um, right. And um, we do know that, that organisms have sensitivities and the ability to respond to situations. And so uh, they're what we could call cognitive. Um, whether they can employ that cognition uh, when they're uh, generating potential evolutionary change, we don't know. We have to explore it. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a real possibility. Yeah, so this is not your research, Jim, but I, I want to ask you a nagging question that I, I think about, which is, um, well, we talked a bit about this. So we had sort of three different types of cells. Um, one of them appears to be a combination of the other two. If we don't, do we have any evidence that the 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 origin, the original life form, happened multiple times on Earth? Uh, I don't think we know very much about the origin of life. Uh, there's, there's two problems there. Uh, one problem is that we don't have fossil evidence of it. Yeah. Uh, we just don't know where it occurred, when it occurred, what was involved in it, its occurring. And the, the second thing is that I don't know that we understand everything that we need to understand about what makes life. 
we're, we're being surprised all the time about what we're learning about genetics and evolution. Maybe there's things about living organisms that we are very important fundamental principles that we have yet to, yet to learn. Uh, so I, I, I think we need to be very cautious in, in uh, trying to, to say that we can understand or explain the origin of life. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm thinking in the context of, you know, this extraterrestrial life-seeking <laughs> uh, astrophysics stuff that's going on. And oh, what, um, what, what, what's that called? It's called... Uh, no, I mean, there are a lot of, lot, of, lot of people looking for extraterrestrial life, uh, including yes. NASA and other space agencies. And on the surface, it appears to be a futile... Um, Pursuit. I mean, this is a purely an opinion. It's cosmic panspermia, that's what it's called. <laughs> but if, if, if we can show that there has been multiple instances of origin of life on Earth, then it becomes more interesting um, because then you could say the probability of finding something outside is higher. But, you know, we, we have no evidence of any sort of advanced life, uh, the Milky Way appears to be really silent <laughs> in every direction. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, I, I, my bias view is that life appears to be quite special on Earth. Well, that, that's a possibility. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll keep looking. <laughs> you have to keep looking, yeah. Yeah, the, the one thing, I think we need to, to, to recognize is that if there were multiple origins of life, not all of them would necessarily have survived. Right. Some because they didn't evolve properly, others because they got uh, preyed upon by the successful life forms. Yeah, so we are only seeing the winner from yeah. potentially a multitude of attempts. Right. And and it, it is it is noteworthy that, that archaea and bacteria are different in, in well defined ways, but they're both DNA based organisms. They share a, a genetic code basically, with some exceptions that are specific in very specific organisms. Um, and so, although we can define them quite well and we can see the differences, the the the, the the similarities are very strong. So um, uh, I would incline to the view that life arose once and diverged, but um, that's just applying Occam's razor, which is, is not a uh, necessarily a good guide to, to uh, understanding that. I, I think that's just going to be one of those things that we're going to be looking for. The other thing is, is if we if we discover life elsewhere in the in the cosmos, and uh, think that it would have been uh, transmitted to Earth, that's just postponing or, or displacing the origin question. Hmm. Because if it originated somewhere else, then how did it originate there? Right. It's, the same problem is towards as we have with the origin of, of life on Earth. Yeah, I mean, it's like what you said. Um, the worst thing is to imagine that we know anything. <laughs> uh, there, there, there is a lot that we need to find out, and so we yeah. have to keep going. I think. Yeah. Yeah, we we know we know certain things, but we we never have the whole picture. <laughs> yes. I mean, I mean, the way I like to put it. Is if Newton couldn't get it right, what hope is there for the rest of us? <laughs> and so, Jim, in conclusion, you know, uh, I know that, I mean, you've been thinking about this, you've written about this, you're teaching this for a long time. What, what, are the, what are the things that you want to know next few years? What would be sort of hot in your research agenda looking forward? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I have uh, any specific expectations, but I'll tell you, I had an experience recently that I knew that mobile elements were involved in setting up networks in, in the genome. 
but I haven't looked directly at the literature on that for a number of years. And then I wrote a, an article where I talked about that and how revolutionary Barbara McClintock's discovery of mobile genetic elements was. And I was amazed at the progress that had been made in discovering how important these elements have been in evolution and, and that people have now better ways of analyzing the genome sequences. So I, I, I think um, I think uh, learning more of, of, of those kinds of things. But, but the, the other thing is uh, c coming up with experimental techniques or experimental protocols where we can find out what are the factors which make for successful evolution. Like we were discussing before, whether having mixtures of cells plays a, uh, gives you a more successful evolution than having pure cultures. And we know that viruses are very important. So maybe having viruses uh, in the in the uh, in the mix uh, can uh, improve the ability to generate novelty, adaptive novelty, um, because we can see, for example, in 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 our own evolution that that uh, uh, early embryonic development in the placenta all involved retroviruses, and. Um, so, yeah. so viruses have played an important role in, in, in human evolution. Um, and the viruses have played uh, other roles in other organisms as well. Yeah, I was just thinking tangentially, Jim, you know, I was saying that, you know, the microbiome, um, mm -hmm. all of us walking around is a combination of <laughs> large number of different types of cells as well. Yeah, well, that, that's been called the hollow biont. That is every large organism plus its associated microorganisms, which have many more, much more genetic information than the, the cells of the large organism, is the, the entity that it evolves. And uh, one of my papers had the title, No Genome is an Island. The idea being that every organism interacts with other organisms, and that plays critical roles in their evolution. We know that organisms exchange DNA, exchange genetic information, and that's important in evolution. Um, and if we take this more sophisticated view of how evolution occurs, I think we can learn some important lessons. And they can be very useful to us when it comes to breeding organisms that we want to do things for us. Yeah, excellent, Jim. Uh, thanks so much for spending time with me. Well, thank you for asking the questions. I, I appreciate them. Uh, it was a pleasure doing the interview. Yeah, and, and put this I, together and send you all the details. Okay, and I hope people enjoy listening to it. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thank you. Sorry for all the fuss at the beginning. Oh, the, it <laughs> happens all the, the time. Teams. Okay. Thank Take you. Take care. Bye. Bye.